Recently, I spoke to my friend, author Heather McGee, about the cost of racism to all of us, including white people. I am here with my friend, Heather McGee, author of the book, The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. Heather, I am just so excited to have you as my uh, guest on this show because I read your book. First of all, I listened to your book uh, and you are narrating it. So that was interesting to hear the words in your own voice. But I was very moved by how um, eloquently you had a very deep and detailed conversation about the economic uh, future of this country and the solutions that we should consider in layman's terms and just spoke to us about where we've been and where we need to go in a way that I think every American can understand. So I just wanted to um, invite you to just kind of give us an overview of this zero-sum game that you start off talking about in the book and what that's about and the consequence of it. Well, thank you so much, Aisha. Congratulations on the show. I can't wait to have you on my television on a regular basis. It's just so fabulous. So um, thank you for reading the book. You know, thank you for introducing these ideas to your audience, because I really wanted to ask the question, why is it that Americans can't seem to have nice things? Why is it we can't have a well-funded public school in every neighborhood and world-class infrastructure and paid family leave and childcare and universal health care? What, what's up with poverty work in a country that is as wealthy as ours? So that's really the core driving question behind the Some of Us. And one of the first really right answers that I came across was that we are being lied to that there is this story, this lie, that is a zero-sum story. And it's the idea that there's sort of a fixed pie of well-being. And if I get a bigger slice, that means somebody else has to get a smaller slice. And it's a racialized story, Aisha, because it's, it's really a sense that's held more commonly among white folks than it is among people of color, that progress for people of color has to come at white folks' expense. That therefore, we're not all on the same team and we're competing with one another for crumbs when actually if we could just come together across lines of race and demand those nice things from the powers that be, we'd all be better off. You know, you traveled across the country and had conversations with people who were impacted by some of these bad policies that frankly started off as being race-based. Could you give us an example of the way, you know, you talk about how racism hurts everybody. Give us an example of what that looks like in policy. I'm, I'm reminded of the mortgage crisis, for example. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's something of a controversial idea, right, the idea behind my book, that we need to expand the aperture and look more broadly, that if you have something as pervasive as systemic racism, it's going to impact more than just the targeted community. It's going to impact us first and worst. But once you start believing a lie and letting that lie write your policies and structures in society, it distorts things for everyone. And so the example that I give is of the financial crisis, which was started back in the late 1990s and the early 2000s with toxic predatory loans targeted at black and brown communities. And so I tell the story of an elderly black family in North Carolina that got targeted by one of these fraudulent loans um, at the beginning of the crisis and how if anybody had cared back then when it was just black wealth being stripped. And I want to be sure in this chapter to make sure everybody knows, A, these were existing homeowners that got refinance loans that often pushed them into foreclosure, and B, these were people with good credit. The majority of subprime loans went to people with good credit in the years up, running up to the crisis. And they just were swindled into taking bad loans because they were aggressively marketed and there were no consumer protections. And so the story of the financial crisis is one that I watched unfold in real time over the course of the 2000s mm. as the regulators didn't care what was going on in black communities. They basically said, you know what? Well, black people are kind of allergic to money. It's not surprising, right, that black people are <laughs> going to end up losing their homes. And this was a quote I heard all the time. We shouldn't have put people into houses they couldn't afford, right? And these are people who are already existing mm -hmm. homeowners and who were getting swindled. And so my thesis in yeah. that chapter is to say, if people had cared enough to stop the discriminatory predatory lending when it was 
only affecting the canary in the coal mine, then we would have all gotten out there safer. And the entire global financial crisis, which ended up costing trillions of dollars in wealth and millions of jobs, um, would not have happened were it not for racism in the lending and then in the indifference to what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I just want to highlight for everyone that you not only watched this happen in real time, you were studying it um, at Demos, uh, a think tank. So you were knee deep in the data and the analysis around the crisis um, in a macro, from a macro, macro perspective. What was interesting to me is that you actually went and met families and people who held these mortgages and had conversations about them and were able to explain and hear in their own words the impact that these policies had on real people. Talk to us about what you hope uh, to come from really humanizing the stories behind the data and the numbers. How do you hope that the public and certainly policymakers are going to receive that? You know, I, I, I'm a person with an economic policy background. It's true that in the 2000s, I was, you know, looking through the bank balance sheets and trying to figure out what was going on and trying to convince policymakers to do the right thing. And I was really a part of the core team that helped advocate for the Wall Street reform bill in the wake of the crash. And so I am a wonk, but I know that everything we believe comes from a story we've been told. And so it was really important to me, Aisha, to write a book that was filled with stories, right? So I tell the story of the financial crisis, but through the lens of the Tomlins, an elderly black couple in North Carolina, a school teacher and an auto mechanic who nearly lost their home, who I sat with on a porch and they told me their stories. And she talked about how her father used to say, just put a little bit of good in the hole before you go. And how that was what was resonating in her mind when she made the decision to stand up and fight for other victims of predatory lending. And I think it's these stories in the some of us that have stuck with people, stories of, of auto workers and fast food workers organizing across lines of race to win higher wages in a union. Um, stories of, of white parents trying to figure out how to do the right thing to try to get their kids into an integrated school when the country's policymakers have walked away from that goal. And I've seen over the past months that the book has been out that there's something about this idea of the drained pool, which is a story I tell of how racism caused white towns to drain their public pools rather than integrate them meaning that something that was a public good then became a private luxury and a private cost, and therefore the entire community lost out. It's that function of self-sabotage that we see across our economy over and over again. I think that that story and stories like that have helped people understand why it seems like we are so dysfunctional. What happened to the American dream? Mm -hmm. Why we invented the greatest middle class the world had ever seen and then walked away from it and traded it in for a low wage billionaire, you know, economy, right? And so I do think that stories matter. I do think that characters and people matter. And I do think that images, like the image of the drained pool, help to explain what's happened as we's, we've really, since integration, been unwilling as mm -hmm. a country to invest in the things that we hold in common. Yeah, you know, those stories are really what moved me and make your book just kind of so, um, it resonates, I think, with people from all walks of life. And you, Heather, one of the things I also love about you is you just lead with this radical empathy. I mean, you, any economist could have written a book dissecting structural racism and its cost, right? And just pointed a finger and said, oh, America's racist, and then we're just done. <laughs> but the way that you approach our systemic you know, struggles aren't necessarily just a, a finger pointing and a blame game. But you also talk about this solidarity dividend with regards to how we can all come together to make it through. Tell us a little bit about the solidarity dividend and, you know, how we win. Well, you know, I think the, the honest truth is that as black people, all that we have overcome, all that we have accomplished, the serious breakthroughs, the Civil Rights Act, Emancipation, the Voting Rights Act, we led, we sacrificed, but ultimately it was also part of our leadership was in getting enough people who were not black to come along and be in partnership. And, you know, 
we did that in so many instances when there was not a black person in government, right? And so that is what I think we have to be aware of right now, as our country is quickly becoming a nation with no racial majority, we've got to start fighting for solidarity dividends. And that's what I call these ideas of these gains that we can unlock, but only when we come together across lines of race. Now, that's made easier when white people and other folks in this country who are not black are willing to own up to and be honest about the extent of racism in our society. And I think that we can take heart that that is happening in unprecedented numbers today. But once we do that, once we're clear that we're all in this together, but you know, there are specific things that have happened to specific mm. communities, and different communities are gonna need different things. But ultimately, when it comes down to it, the things that matter the most in life, we can't as individuals achieve on our own, right? I can tutor my son, mm -hmm. I can't make his neighborhood public school better on my own. I can recycle. I can't stop yeah. global climate change on my own. So it's really about what we can do together and what as we become more diverse, we're gonna have to do across lines of race in order to take on the power of concentrated wealth. Well, Heather, your book is fascinating. I am so proud of you and excited to announce to everyone that it has been nominated for a 2021 Nonfiction National Book Award. Go get your copy. Thank you very much for having this conversation with us. I hope you'll come back because there's so many deep issues to get into that we'll want you to come and explain some more to us soon. Thanks, Heather.